computer. There we go. Okay, welcome, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Just a few minutes before eight. I'm very excited. As you know, I'm Dan Winter, fractalfield.com, fractalu.com. And we have exciting guests for this evening, Lydia and Arturo, going to be talking about very advanced projects in biologic architecture. And Lydia's work with geopathic measurements and many things. Uh, and first, we just have a few announcements. Um, actually, so, uh, Tufan, should we do our few announcements? Yes. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Tufan, geomagicmodels.org. Um, we have a few announcements to make. Um, our first one is um, our recent um, quarterly newsletter is up online now at geomagicmodels.org slash newsletters. I'll add a link uh, to the chat box here, and you'll be able to uh, read the recent developments from geometric models and the quiet message from Dan Winter. And um, our next week's lecture will be also Dan Winter's. We'll be talking about why does attraction track center of gravity? Sufis have applied this. Scientists agree the cause of gravity. Charge collapse is also the cause of consciousness. Both are a centripetal, fractal symmetry, center of compressional, longitudinal, EMF. So yeah. we'll be covering that next week. That was why does the attention uh, track center of gravity? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. It's okay. yeah. And that's it. Thank you. And uh, Tufan and I are excited to announce that our September 19 conference uh, is nearing sold out status already. We have about 30 or 40 rooms already booked. Beautiful event in South France, fractalfield.com slash 2024. And also uh, our Progress with the piezofire.com. We're catching up on shipments. Demand and interest has been incredible. And we continue to have wonderful reports from piezofire.com, including from Dan Mack, as we were just discussing tonight, uh, found help with his foot and many things. And he's now alternating from the piezo to the inductor Tesla coil device and having success and enthusiasm. So things are cool and fun and uh, we are making wonderful progress. And by the way, our YouTube channel is just about to celebrate 50,000 subscribers, 3 million in views, 400 films. And uh, so this whole project's going wonderful. And thanks, of course, to Tufan for adding the wonderful momentum from his wonderful Instagram and big audience. So now uh, let's see. Now I'm going to do the intro for Arturo and Lydia. <laughs> Don't they look handsome and young tonight? Really more handsome and young than I even remember. <laughs> They said it's love that does it. <laughs> but, it <laughs> but anyway, just the, the, the short story is, you know, is it about 25 years ago or something now that Arturo, that we started? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so Arturo basically came to us and says, you know, he really wants to bring this and teach this to South America, the Spanish speaking world and bring it to a new level. And we took him seriously. And in the end, we ended up doing something like 10 or 12 major South American lecture tours. We did Mexico City, I don't know, half a dozen times. And Arturo and friends sponsored an incredible biologic architecture conference at the major university there in Mexico City, which was sold out and incredible. University students were over, overwhelmed. And so that was a super successful project. You can see the films at bioarchitects.net. So Arturo, we go back a long way. Plus when, when Arturo was bicycling across South France, God, was he pretending to be young. <laughs> I was jealous actually. <laughs> and, but it, Arturo has been super brave and powerful and now in the publishing area in Spanish and put out my newest book in Spanish, plonkfire.com. Really wonderful. And they have a whole new level of professional biologic architects projects around the world. They're about to tell you about geophilia and more. And then just a, a, another short thought about Lydia here. So Lydia was there working incredibly hard in Athens, Greece. And she was doing uh, graduate, uh, I don't know, graduate studies. And she was studying, a PhD was, yes, sorry, PhD. And it was, um, she was focused on technologies and tools to measure geopathic zones, geopathic earth, et cetera, and really got into the electrical engineering of how do you make electrical measures of geopathics. And I was totally impressed. Like not often we electrical engineers get to talk to somebody that serious and she was serious. She stacked up the technologies and got the gadgets and started making measurements. 
really impressive. And, and so I was so impressed that I helped Lydia to come to one or two of our major international conferences, <laughs> the one here in South France, at which she happened to meet <laughs> Arturo. <laughs> and not too long after that, they got married. <laughs> Talk about a happily ever after. It's so cool. And they're a wonderful team. And we're going to have fun tonight. And without further ado, I am interested in introducing Arturo and Lydia. Please take it away. Oh, Dan, thank you so much. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Very happy to be in this uh, sacred geometry, biological architecture family. Thank you so much to Fan also for all the work, big family. And then, yeah, of course, uh, we've been many, many years. Many lifetimes. <laughs> many lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I need to see myself a little bit. Yeah, I think you st you stayed younger than me, though. I, I it, It's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know how Yeah, so make... what happened, just a little note on what Dan said. So I was doing my PhD, which was on yeah. uh, geobiology. So how, um, let's say, earth radiation anomalies, they affect our health. The, the way also they affect animals and plants. And I, I was really looking, looking into deeply um, on temple technology, ancient temple technology, why they were placed on these anomalies and then diving into what was the function of ancient temples. So Dan invited me in the first uh, conference. We were in touch then. It was very kind because I think it was two years before that. I was in his house for two weeks. We exchanged a lot of things, very interesting conversation. So, so grateful about all that. And then in the conference, yeah, Arturo was doing a bike trip in Europe and he passed through Dan and Dan said to him, like, I'm doing this amazing conference, you should come. So that's what happened. And so seven years after, here we are uh, with a company together and we're, we're very grateful for Dan, honestly, because physically speaking, thanks to you, Dan, we are together. So. Yes, and connecting Athens and Mexico and around the world, very international, very powerful. Please, please, please. Yeah, Sorry. things are, yeah. are getting amazing. So yeah. what we'll be sharing with you, with all, all the um, people involved, is about architecture like sacred geometry, applied architecture. So we have had many companies regarding how to apply this. And, oh, hello from Mexico City. Yeah. Oh, hi, Francesca. <laughs> Yeah, Francesca, long time ago. Sweetheart, Francesca. Yeah, 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 Francesca, we know her. Ah, you know her. Yeah, yeah. Not the yeah. other Francesca from, yeah. from Barcelona. Yeah. So uh, it has been many, many years, I think more than 20 years that we start, you know, exploring how sacred geometry can be applied into healing through sacred geometry. And then we were working with many doctors about that. And then we extrapolate that same technology of sacred geometry healing or helping to restore the electromagnetic fields and the gravitational fields into architecture. So eventually I studied architecture, I then studied psychology, and I have been studying many things. But um, the work that we'll present uh, now that we'll be sharing screen is like many years, you see, like very condensed information. So it's a lot of information. A lot. Really, yeah, yeah <laughs> many slides. We're really happy to share it with you. Some projects you will see that they're built, other we're in the process of building. And there is one that we really like that now we're in the permit process. It's yes. in Tulum, um, near Tulum, like uh, 30 minutes from there. And it's a six minutes video, five minutes video actually, that we put so much uh, like hours and hours of work. So you will see that we, we really like it. So let's begin with um, sharing screen. These biologic architecture projects are so high level and professional and beautiful. It's really eye popping. I was just so impressed what Arturo and Lydia are doing. Geophilia. Yeah, so that's our company. So it's Love for the Earth. That's where that came from. I mean, it's a Greek name, but actually Arturo found the name. It's not me. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, here we are, sacred geometry architecture and the science of space harmonics. Uh, this is a term that we've coined in geophilia. We'll explain more. And of course, it has to do with all, all your work and research on harmonics. Dan, this is just applied in architecture. Beautiful. Uh, so I'll just go through a very short temple pilgrimage because I would like people to have like a visual and energetically speaking also of temples around the world. And what you will start observing for everyone out there, and I would like you to invite to observe it, is that 
ancient temples had a very high level of fractality in their design. That means that we don't see straight lines, and when we do see, it's for a particular reason, but the majority um, has this crazy, detailed, complex contours, and that has a reason. It's not there by chance. So if we want to, um, let's say, create the best holistic healing architecture, biological architecture of today, we absolutely have to learn by what ancient civilizations have done. And in my opinion, I and I think most people here will agree, is that they had other advanced technology that we don't have today. So we'll see just uh, very quickly different temples around the world, uh, how they're built, like look at this repetition and this fractality, look at the contour of these things. I mean, if you look at it from a perspective of electrical engineering, you just see um, basically antennas. Like this for me, when I was uh, researching deeply into that, uh, it's definitely technology. It's not something that you do because you want to put so much effort and energy in creating this so complex and hours and years and who knows what more of work. I mean, unless they had this advanced technology, but for example, here we see the Asian temples, right? Um, this one particular, I have been there in the temple of heaven. It's just incredible. Uh, all Asia, just look at this contour, this fractal uh, repetition everywhere. It's really incredible. Now, if we look at ancient Greek temples, I'm from Greece, by the way, if, uh, people don't know, but people ask me like, oh, but here we see, you know, um, like more rectangular things, more straight lines. But the reality is if you start looking, uh, all that indentation in and out, if, for example, in this area, this top part is called triglyphon, and it has this repetition of three, which is another contour. And then the columns themselves, they have this fractal contour. It's not just a basic cylinder. It's carved in that way that every column has this very high level of fractality that gives it in the contour. Uh, so by the way, this is my favorite temple in Greece. It's called Temple of Athea. Uh, it's in the um, cover of our book in which Dan gave us a very nice foreword. So if you want to have a look at it, it's called The Power of Sacred Location. Uh, it, this came through all my research of my PhD. So a few more ancient Greek temples, we observe the same. Then we go to mosques. We have more straight lines here, but it's such a high level embedded sacred geometry that we don't even see anywhere around the world, like just incredible levels of sacred geometry everywhere. I just look at these structures, they're called murkhanas. They are even in 3D. So these are created in 3D and uh, if, even if today we were asked to create these things with 3D printing and everything, I'm talking like from the part of architects and construction, it's pretty difficult. And then we go to um, the different pyramids around the world that we find from Mexico to Egypt um, and different places. This is Borobudur. I mean, again, we have an incredible high level of fractality in these ones. And they have a different way to create that repetition. And then we go to stone circles that, in my opinion, they're another uh, type of temple because they literally uh, embed all the three parameters that uh, we will see at the end after we go through all the architecture things. So we have France, of course, in Karnak, Sweden, Scotland, they're all around and really important. And then we have megalithic monuments, meaning that they are built uh, inside the earth or carved like a uh, new Grange in Ireland and Silbury Hill and Hetra. Kailasa temple complex, there are a few of them. They are literally carved out of solid rock. And then we go to cathedrals. That's where all the Cathar Templar technology comes, which of course came from Atlantean knowledge. And again, we observe very, very high level of fractality and explicit sacred geometry. Just look at this contour. I mean, it will be so much easier to make just a straight line, right, in the um, in the roof and everywhere else. So antennas everywhere. <laughs> and we will explore a little bit at the end. Roslyn Chapel, of course, such an important monument. And I have been there and it's just so powerful. And so what we have been doing um, with Arturo creating, uh, apart from Geophilia, we have put together what we call live harmonics and here we have uh, put together this uh, concept which is the internal space harmonics and their turn external i will explain what that means but when we bring these two in harmony we have live harmonics so at uh, the external space harmonics is basically our architecture it's our environment where we live in it's our room and so 
this we can find these harmonics in five levels. In the chemical level, which has to do with the fire element, in the electromagnetic level, which has to do with the earth element, gravitational level, which has to do with the water element, informational with the air element, and quantum, which is the ether. But we also have these five levels internally. So we have an internal space that we need to work on, as Dan very nicely has shown with all of his work, you know, our hard brain coherence, our, our levels of fractality, and how we can approach bliss. And so we have vital, physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. So we have our inner space, an external space, and this is like a torus field that uh, all the time we have a feedback loop, right? We take a, a information from our environment, we take them in, and we also give back to the environment. Yeah, so what we have after many decades of work, we have seen that it's not only changing the architecture outside, because we have done that sometimes with people that they're not very well balanced or they're sick. We change everything outside and it's like really fractal, but then inside, no. So if there is not an internal work to create this fractality between the internal and the external, there is no such a high level you know, of, of health. So the science is space harmonics, like literally in all levels, like in terms of geometry, in terms of what materials we will use, in terms of how we will locate it, like in specifically in the land. And space harmonics is basically how we weave, like, you know, this, uh, the spirals that you can see there, how we can weave all the elements of architecture, for example, from the colors, the materials, the shapes, the, like, everything blends into the most harmonic way. That is space harmonics. It's like the way music works as well. Uh, this also, uh, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Bruce Lipton's epigenetics, but basically he explains that it's not our genes that uh, control um, our health and our, our well-being, but it's actually the environment. So we are a colony of cells, and guess what? The liquid that we are always surrounded with is architecture. So it's a big aspect of our health and our well-being in all these levels. So this is the um, Blue Zone research, and actually one of them is Ikari Island in Greece. Uh, I have been there, and Arturo also, and he really loves it. It's a very powerful place, and guess what? It has all this radon and radioactivity that we will see in a bit. But the creator, uh, who is Dan Buter of the Blue Zone, says from research that he did all around the world, he says your environment is the biggest, most impactful thing you can do to favor your own happiness. And our environment is literally our building and our, it's like our, we have our physical skin, we have our clothes, our second skin, and then we have the walls and the buildings, which is our third skin. Of course, we spend 90% of our time in, in buildings. So we have to think that a proper design will either help us get uh, you know, healed or will promote sickness. So of course, this is uh, amazing uh, done images. And it has to do with wave interference, like constructive wave, wave interference when you create them in a space versus destructive wave interference. So the, the whole goal is to create that through harmonic inclusiveness that you can see it's like this self-organization or self-coherence. And it's exactly what I was saying for people that, you know, they need to understand it in a very simple way. Is like, imagine if all the different elements of an architectural space are different music notes or different musical instruments. So the same way we can listen to an orchestra and that's like a harmonic result and we like it. It's exactly the same with, thing with architecture. The only difference is is that music, for example, is geometry in time, whereas architecture is frozen music, which is a, a quote by Goethe that I really love. So we have frozen in music in a specific moment in time, but my guesses are, and that's just my own idea, I really feel that very soon we will explore architecture that moves in time, that we will have buildings that rotate, that change a facade, that change their shape yeah, or well, whatever. I mean, I mean, publicly in a, in a mass scale. So. I really think that's the next step in our architecture in the future. Here, I would like to say, share with you a, a, an amazing result we, ha we have had with uh, working with sacred geometry and biological architecture. So this is the biggest organic producer in Greece. We're talking about, you know, a super huge company, millions and huge land. The land is like, uh, I don't know, a huge city. They began, they had the number one accreditation of organic agriculture back in the 70s. This guy is super humble, uh, very deep in like philosophically, and he still wakes up at five in the morning to go to his land with his tractor because he loves his land. 
So uh, it's in a really beautiful place somewhere in the mid area of Greece, uh, very pristine, and he inherited it from his grandfather. So he has actually uh, ancient seeds and he has ancient type of wheat that um, he has checked it in laboratories and actually it doesn't create problems for people with celiac. So it's very interesting. So what we were called to do is that he created a new expansion of his factory to store his seeds and his products. And he called us in and it was a thousand square meters. And what we did was basically two things because we could not even influence the whole design because he had panels and things that he could not change. So we wove a specific geometry that we created just for his project based on his analysis that we will explain in a bit. So this is picture from there. It was the beautiful sunset where we were finishing the last day. So this is from the actual project. And we also mixed a special powder with crystals and other things in the concrete that they lay in all of the, um, uh, the new area. So what happened, uh, so here you can see the... Um, yeah, yeah and, and it's also important to say that we couldn't affect the design. It was, it was all metal, all concrete, like it was not the best place to do no. it, let's say. But what we managed to do is to put these powders, crystals, obsidian, etc. And the geometry. Uh -huh, and the geometries. And the result that he no. was not expecting. So one year later from that, that has been already a few years, but one year later, he kept seeds in the new area that we worked on. And then in the area of the old area of his factory. And so he uh, put these seeds in uh, like a same piece of land that he has. It was not even in different pieces of land. And this is the result. So what we can see is like uh, the seeds that he kept in the area that we worked on with the geometry and the powders just grew many, many times more. And this is the result that he gave to us by himself because he actually likes to test things. That's so beautiful. Like, um, you know, they sorry? say that, they say that ancient stone circles, one of the primary functions was to zap the seeds. And the effect yes. is so dramatic because the seeds need a centripetal field to get ready to germinate. Such a beautiful demo. <laughs> yeah, and what happens is that he then came to us like, okay, can you explain me what happened with this thing? Because he believed on that, but one thing is believing and another thing was seeing it. So we explained him like, actually there is the electromagnetic field, but we also have an informational field. Like we, mm -hmm. we literally can affect through the quality of shape. Yeah. The electromagnetic field. Yeah. And the, the molecules are stacked to implode, and that's it's that force to suck, which is the first germination effect. So if the seed is put in a centripetal field before germination and it builds that inertia to begin to implode and suck, that's what germination is made of electrically. It's perfect. Yeah, it was just amazing. Yeah, we were and so we happy have had, with his. We, we have had many. Lovely, lovely demo. Okay, so. Um... Yeah, this is a project that we will explain the way we, we have been working with different uh, clients in different projects. So the whole four steps, you will see it applied in one project that is called Chemix. Chemix is a chakra healing hotel in Tulum. So it's all based on the chakra. So. Take a tea, your coffee, whatever you have, you know, like some nice smoothie. It's four minutes video. It's all animation. We just finished this this video animation. It, it took was like three weeks of rendering. Yeah, rendering a lot of time. Wow. It's a wow. that has taken two years. like two, three years yeah. to to you know like to start doing it. So just four minutes. Um yeah, cool. It's cool. It has some music, so Ideally, you will be able to listen. Wow, it's beautiful. We're, we're not hearing the music. Impressive. That's big. Yeah, it's really big. Can you hear now? No, unfortunately. Now we've had some problems. No. When you play- Yeah, we, we generally have issues um, listening yeah. to music when uh, videos are on. So it might not about you guys. Yeah, it's- mm, Okay. Mm. So that's no. the reception. I'll put oh. music. 
So you built you built this with what software or in in the rendering? Yeah, we'll be better at telling you uh, about it. So this is a uh, all built with the software that is called Revit. So it's a uh, build um, information model. So we know exactly how you know it's the proper model. It's not like AI kind of rendering. So it's a proper architectural model. So what we're seeing here is some some glamping that every part of the project is related to chakras. So the first thing that you saw now, what you're seeing is a fire pit and some area for bathrooms and showers. And what you saw at the beginning that we go all the way around is a hotel, like a proper uh, hotel. So this is a cenote. It will be, a, a, it has to be- Natural pool. Yeah, a natural pool cenote that it exists in the area. A lot of solar, solar panels. This, this is, is the main area of the hotel that is based on a torus field, as you can see with the, with the top design. Wow. Yeah, so what we, uh, because of regulations, we have to use the structure. It has to be done with concrete. So there is no way to not use concrete for the, because of the height and et cetera. But we're, we're putting um, additives on the concrete, like magnesium, et cetera. And grounding this, also the steel. Yeah, and, all the steel is grounded. Like, and all the walls is all natural materials. Yeah, and we, we have a lot of stone there, so we can use a lot of stone. And um, yeah, this is like a dome that they 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 did. And then uh, there is another part that is a shala, which is for yoga, and it's all made with natural wood from the area. So you can see there in the left. Yeah, this will come in a bit in the video. Yeah, and also there is an astronomical tower. That yes, one, this one, which is we we shaped it in a way of a torus. So it's like the part inner the part, like the singularity part, right? Uh, like so actually this video, we put it to X, so it's four minutes, otherwise it will take a lot of time. But here you will see uh, Temazcal, because this area, of course, it's in Mexico, so there is... A traditional Mexican healing. This is the Shala, so here it's for meditation, for yoga. We have a special geometry that we did for them, and we'll explain how we do geometries for every project. A little uh, outdoor massage area. Wow. Labyrinth. Yeah, like and the labyrinth. yeah, the place is completely. Oh, wow. I love um, the labyrinth. <laughs> yeah, uh, chill out nets, so, you know, to relax there. And here is a Mayan temple, so it's based on uh, Mayan ancient symbolism and the four directions. A lot of smoke here, like incense. <laughs> yeah, they wanted, they asked us actually that, like, we want incense and copal everywhere. So here we are in the hotel. You will see a little bit how it is inside. So every um, suite is based on a particular chakra. So all the suites are uh, different in terms of their colors. They have different geometries embedded. Um, and they are based on a, an ellipse. So yeah, pi ratio X. Exactly. Wow. This is down, and then if you go up, you have like- Yeah, so this is another one, as you see, other colors, other geometries. Every bed below has its own geometry, which is based on the cymatics of that chakra and the frequency. So it's not visible, but it's under the bed. And of course, the colors and everything is- Finished. Related to that. Wow, that's amazing. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, it's a really- Yeah, big it's bed. like 3,000 square meter, uh, like construction the overall pro program yeah. and the land is really big the the land is 10,000 square meters yeah wow. uh, and, so. and is it is it like permitted and underway now or we yeah. are doing the permits as we speak uh -huh. so we have negative projects and we are now uh managing all the permits with them and everything else totally so, impressive guys we were yeah. very happy about that so very professional here, uh, we basically have created something we call the Geophilia Design System, and this is uh, in five levels. And I will explain a little bit, and then we will see how we uh, worked on this particular project. So first is what we call a client analysis. In this level, we do something called the five element chart, in which one we know what elements and what geometries are good for the particular client. And when we have a team of clients, like in this chemics, there are four people, it's the core, uh, it's two couples actually. So we have to implement all of their elements. Also in terms of geometries, so that informs our design. So we do the most conscious choices, even when we start the master plan. So in this case, uh, when we started the master plan, uh, we also do harmonic voice analysis. This is based on cymatics. 
So we analyze their voice, we know their geometry, and we create something also called, based on all that, which is called their symbol of power, which is a mixture, top, bottom left is what we call the symbol of power. So this comes from their five element chart and from their voice analysis and other things that we do. And we also have a particular color palette. Uh, now, this particular project, for many reasons and for their own elements, uh, has a very, uh, on the one side, it has a very fluid design because they needed that particular element. So it has a, a lot of free flowing curves in the master plan. And also the basic archetype that we use that again has to do with the mixture of their energy and the particular function of the project is the torus. So we have kind of isolated parts of the torus and we have adapted them in different areas of this development according to you know the the function so for example the hotel as you saw the astronomical tower uh, there is another space that is uh, called a psychedelic chill out space that is based on a, a spiral um part of the torus so all of it is literally uh even in the master plan level it's uh, left and right there is like uh, you will see it in a bit there is uh, parts of the torus Phase two for uh, uh, the Geophilia design system is what we call land analysis. And this is where it comes all the research that I was doing in my PhD. So this is analyzing the land to find geophysical anomalies, uh, underground water, fault lines, and all other kinds of things, and also the implosion area. So that's where we place what we call the heart of the space. And also Arturo, you know, that he's really expert in sacred geometry. He uh, makes particular grids in the project. He lays it out. This is the land in the bottom in the particular project. So it's a very longitudinal land, as you can see, that had its challenges. So this is how we applied uh, specific sacred geometry yeah, the, grids. Yeah, all these grids help us to design the whole thing. So it's all, you know, like mixed, let's say, or, or weaved. Mm -hmm. And in the phase three in architectural design, we combine all our findings from phase one, which is client analysis, phase two land analysis. And in, in, its, uh, in its form, this holistic design has to do with a lot of things. So of course, sacred geometry, we do conscious master plan or holistic master plan. We have auspicious layout according to ancient traditions like uh, feng shui or avastu. We have bioclimatic uh, strategies. This is something I studied in my master's. We do permaculture and we have also other things like uh, sustainable material uh, selection, which has to do with building biology. So, you know, emissions of materials, if we cannot uh, change something, you know, what can we add as a remedy in many cases? Yeah, and we have seen that it's actually applying, let's say, a healthy or a sacred geometry building. It's not like black and white. Yeah. It has like gradients. So you can go like really hardcore. We'll see one project that is called Bios de La that the, the owner was hardcore. I don't want to see one piece of metal. I don't want to see any concrete. I want everything natural. So you, you will see that. Yeah, so as you see here, the holistic master plan, even um, the, the main development is like a toroid in the center with different functions. And then there is like kind of a half toroid right and a half toroid left. So in the left part, we have the glamping area that you see in yellow. And in the right part, we have uh, the, the purple area, which is the hotel area. And in the center, we have the main shala, the entrances for here. And of course, these uh, orientations also had to do with this uh, auspicious layout and ancient traditions. Uh, this is like a, a view from a render. Uh, this is how the hotel rooms look. So they are like this uh, sacred geometry egg. So it's uh, really meant for healing. And they all, as you see, uh, below the bed, they have their own geometry based on the 22 chakra. Yeah, so what we did is that we put the geometry under the bed and then over the bed. So it's like um, in between. Of course, you're sleeping there in between. Yeah. This, this is, is the entrance, the reception. Yeah. We'll see many. Also, renders. sorry, I wanted to say that this is half a torus again. So uh, we see this part of torus repetitive. Uh, this is like creating more fractality in the whole project because they are all coming back to the same archetypal shape. This is a restaurant, which it has, again, this... this uh, Toroidal yeah, column. I mean, we, yeah. we saw many of these images in the in the video, so I'll just skip that part. Yeah. Here, this is the one of the chakras because they, they have 22 chakras. So this is one of the chakras with its geometry according to the cymatics uh, extraction. And in the, in the phase four, we have the construction phase that we talked a little bit about 
yeah, so after we finish with the construction details, let's say, uh, we have a few things that we can add in the construction phase to make even the space harmonics higher. So one is like weaving uh, geometry grids below the finished floor. And this happens with a special alloys metal wire. And this can, we have applied it in uh, many buildings. It can also be like uh, an apartment. It can be an existing space. So this is an example uh, of an apartment. Yeah, this is many days of work. Like literally we put this huge geometry. We, uh, and we, we drill. Yeah, we drill it and then we start weaving it. So this is other examples. And this we can apply it in sacred geometry art. So this is another layer of increasing the space harmonics after construction. And it can be as detailed as as literally art. Like it can be, you know, like more more refined. And also, what we were saying before is to add this fractal dash that we have, which is we add it in the concrete, we add it in all the paint and uh, in any varnishes. So that has a lot of uh, results in in kind of in many kind of different uh, like from seed germination to uh, measurements to other things. So it also counterbalances the effects of EMF and it's really an amazing thing. So that's in the construction phase and now we will see a few more uh, projects. Yeah, so here we have a lot of renders. So I will just go, you know, kind of flowing like uh, because then we have all the part where we'll be explaining all the science for temples and how these, the science of how to create temples actually teach us how to not create you know, like very crazy fractals in places that we'll be living. Yeah, this is something that many people have asked us, and especially me, because I did all this uh, PhD on the temples, and they're like, oh, we should design our house like a temple. And my answer is no, <laughs> because there is an effect called hormesis that I will explain in a bit, which means that temples have a very high level of fractality, intensity, uh, complexity, if you like, and they are meant for many different things like a healing and alter states of consciousness and seed germination that we will see in a bit. But we don't want to live every day in that field because it's too much. And unless someone, I, I say that, you know, I really believe that, unless someone is like in an enlightened state or a very advanced being, yes, they can live in spaces like that. But where we are, sometimes living in a, an extremely complex house can actually create, you know, counterproductive results. It's so we need much energy. simple, yeah, more, more simple in terms of its energy. So this one is called the uh, Aiki Healing Center. This this was built like four years ago. We designed everything. So it has a cascade, you know, water Zen flowing, garden. a Zen garden. It's, it's a place, a Japanese place. Um, and also we want to share like, yeah, this is the, the inner core. So it has a toroidal effect and this is in the center. So it's like this huge geometry that is literally structuring the whole place. But what we want to share is also in many times in the build projects, some things are changed by the contractor. So you will see our renders that are a little bit different than, than yeah, what so has this, happened. These but... are some actual pictures, Yeah, but we, we propose something like this, you know, like in the facades, we were using different type of materials. So they had to use for regulations concrete, but then we were having different layers of wood, you know, like natural yeah. wood. And there were a few other things like, yeah, I mean, we, we really prefer this version. But anyway, this is the, the central area with the geometry. And of course, the water, they did that. And it's lovely to give such a subtle feel to the whole building. They have healing spaces. They have a conference room inside. Um, yeah, and the Zen garden in the back is just beautiful. This one is the one I was I was sharing with you about a hardcore. This this was built uh, like twelve years ago. It's a, a Bios uh, Lila. It's a Montessori school, and everything is natural materials. Like the foundation is stone, uh, like no no cement. They were using limestone. The walls, hardcore. yeah, like hardcore. All the structure itself you can see here is bamboo like everything is bamboo. Uh, the walls by itself is made with, the, they're plastered with natural materials and they're made of um, paja, you say, you see, you can see it here, like the whole structure. And then very nice, they put a, a vitral, they put like a, a lot of sun, you know. And the whole thing is actually based on a double golden uh, spiral. Yeah, actually it's a double, it's like a hard shape. Wow. Wow. This, this was like really hardcore. Like he the, the owner said, I don't want to see like any, any chemical any thing. Uh, 
So this is a beautiful hemp and crypto community. This uh, is in the process of uh, finding funding for the project because it's really huge. So again, a lot of this is the land, as you see, it has at the end, it has a little bit of a of a, an extrusion there, but uh, they have different areas. Uh, they have a conference or uh, like a sharing center in the far right, as you see, which is the entrance to the place. Um, they have all, yeah, they ask us to create like all these uh, shared areas and concert hall. Um, it's called Earth Angel. So there was an inspiration for the central part. If you see that there are the the two uh, wings of an angel, actually. Yeah, and what you can see here, for example, this, this area is for uh, apartments. Yeah. And we actually doesn't have to be, sometimes you don't, you, you cannot do crazy biophilic shapes. So actually what we did is only in the facade, we were playing with that. Yeah. Because sometimes people, they literally cannot yeah. build more cones. There is a Vesica, uh, Vesica water area, water pool, uh, an outdoor amphitheater. Um, and yeah, there are other public spaces. Like we really love this project. Uh, yeah, this is from the conference center, the roof. Lotus of the Heart is a, is a healing center. It's based on a mandala. This is for in USA. And it's a double torus, actually. It's like one torus in the top, one torus in, in down. Uh, in the, like a huge triandra um, cuboctahedron in the middle with the flower of life like in between. And this is more like a conceptual design. Actually, practically to, to build it, we, we, it will need like far more work, let's say, you know, like the, depending on materials, etc. So you can see here like many renders and many options. Oasis Retreat Center, this is in Argentina, which is, this we were proposing to use a ferro cement because of the shape, they, they couldn't afford like natural materials. But if we ground the ferro cement, the part, you know, like the, the metal of the it. The steel rebar. Uh -huh, the steel rebar. So it's based on the flower of life. That it's an abstraction of the flower of life with a lot of water because they have a very, very uh, like a lot of rain. And, and in the center of every room, as you can see, there is like a golden spiral uh, uh, egg. Co that is cone. Cone, yeah, pine cone, exactly. Yeah. So it activates every room, and it's like a. Yeah, yeah, and the idea is to go inside there to meditate. Exactly. So here you can see like different. Um, Night and day. Right. Night and day. And then Pent Flower, which is based on the, of course, in this image that we have in the back, like all the science of the super imploder, like the ultra imploder, how to, you know, like through golden spirals, like suck all this uh, information on all this energy. There is a fire pit in the center of the Pent Flower, and then there are different houses because it's a part of a small community. Yeah, we will just go like. Yeah. So this is like, um, uh, it's a greenhouse and community in Canada. So uh, this particular client wanted a kind of a, a Giza pyramid. That, so as you can see, it has like eight sides. Uh, there is a cube octahedron in the middle. There is a temple that you see in the top right. And there are many other areas like to, for people to stay. Um, and it was a, a pyramid greenhouse. Oops, he actually, sorry. yeah. Here. You wanted a greenhouse, a huge greenhouse. Yeah, so the pyramid itself is a greenhouse, which is really spectacular. <laughs> and this is like you see the entrance. This is the inside part. Like, are, are some just say briefly which which ones are in the stages of the building or st the stages of? The, yeah, if... they are. They are in in the process of being built, like these that we're sharing. And you know, in Mexico, you need a lot of yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah KMX has been there since some time now, a few months, you know, with the building permit regulations. So these are some other projects that we've done. Uh, this is in the post plan with different aspects, you know, of sacred geometry and uh, internal pools. And yeah, it's just to let your imagination flow and get some inspiration of like the, the work we've been doing. Rice Hotel, this is in Costa Rica, actually. We proposed this option, but they ended up building something that we didn't like. Mm -mm. Like they ended up doing the typical, you know, squares and the typical boxes. That, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's very uh, common that sometimes people, when you propose them something different or you propose them something that it's not a box, that it takes them some time actually to process it and to 
you or sometimes to... it's uh, financial reasons in the construction like uh, sometimes the contractors say oh this is gonna um it's gonna cost too much or whatever and they impose their own things so there is some of a challenge sometimes there so this is a private villa in costa rica uh this person is like super high level in terms of his knowledge uh he knows all about you dan and your work and a lot of other things he's like one of the highest level clients we have so it was a long process. Yeah, it has a lot of uh, Taurus. It has a Triskelion, uh, which was an inspiration that we had. And uh, when we showed it to him, he absolutely fell in love with it. And so uh, this is the, the front part, which has like the south area facade. You will see it has all the spirals. And this is based on his elements again. And uh, there are also some other outdoor spaces like he wanted, uh, like the ones that you see here for meditation. Uh, there is a healing labyrinth. There is a yoga deck. Um, and these are some internal spaces, but they're like all based on the spiral. Like this was the, the most important yeah, in the integral part. And much of that was built, right? Or Yes. And yeah. this one, for example, this we like it a lot because it's... Um, it's explicit geometry. So the facades are literally explicit so geometry. So this is a Vipassana community. So the idea here was to create more introvert spaces. So the, the light gets structured through the geometry uh, all around in, in the windows. So inside it hits you like coming more to the inward. Like this is a process of Vipassana, like to go more Beautiful. inward. Beautiful. Amma Center, this, this place is uh, like two hours from Mexico City that it's all made with super adobe. So it's like these little eggs and again, all natural materials, this one um, based on, on, on an egg. Uh, Michael Rice loves eggs. <laughs> for oh, absolutely. And this is like an Airbnb that is called Harmony House. So here we worked only in the interior. It was an existing building and it's, a, it's an Airbnb that they also provide like uh, organic breakfasts and all these things. It has really lovely energy and the view is to Meteora. Uh, actually, some people say that uh, this meteora, like uh, huge, um, like uh, extruding little hills, uh, that they are um, very old giant trees. So uh, yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, it that can be. Thing. So apart from the design that we do, we have something that we call Geophilia Masters. And this is for people that are interested in um, getting educated in all these things. So this is 12 modules. It's over 96 hours of, of uh, video lectures that we do and the PDF of every module. Um, and this can be for architects, designers, but we've also had healers, people that work with just healing of the spaces or people that just want to know this uh, knowledge for themselves. So we have uh, module one, fractal science. Module two is human consciousness as the fractal vision of life. Module three, sacred geometry. We do a lot of drawing. Yeah. Module four, bioclimatic design. Module five, earth radiation. Uh, module six, we go into artificial radiation and bioelectromagnetism. And then we have module seven, harmonic layouts and auspicious design. Uh, then we have permaculture and community design, module eight. Module nine is all about the temples that we will see a little bit about it today. Module 10 is all our bio, uh, geophilic design and uh, we, we give examples of projects. And module 11 is epigenetics and module 12 is the science of space harmonics with exactly what solutions and things that we use to uh, bio, even biohack, you know, uh, for example, Wi-Fi and artificial radiation, what we do with formaldehyde in terms of, uh, you know, artificial wood or plywood that is very problematic. So we have, uh, we have had many clients and many people that contact us like, I cannot sleep. I have a lot of problems with sleep. What can I do, you know? So we put together, if you go to geophilia.org, we put together a PDF with a lot of information. Like it really has tons of information. 15 links. years of research for this PDF, guys. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important PDF. So just go there, you, you can download it there. And it has all the links of what to do, what not to do, what to avoid, what not to avoid, because we can talk, you know, hours exactly. and hours uh, about that. Okay, and now we will, I wanted to give you a little bit of a short overview of all the work that um, uh, we've done in the temples. This also uh, comes from my PhD. So I was looking at temples around the world and I found that there are three basic parameters that they all have 
uh, and that's universal, independent of their background, meaning their cultural, their religious background, their aesthetics, their architectural style, and all these things. And the first of the three, I call it the earthling. And this has to do with the location of the temples. So that was never done in a random way. It was never placed unconsciously. Um, so there is what we call the earth grid. Uh, there are uh, nodes of this earth grid. There are many people that studied these earth grids. And there are nodes. And in ancient times, we had uh, radiesthesia. We had people in many ways that were checking for these geopathic zones uh, from the ancient Chinese. So what is geobiology? It's basically the science that uh, shows us how a site or a location can affect uh, the biosphere, meaning our own biology, plants, and animals. And this uh, also is mentioned by Hippocrates, which is the father of our modern medicine. And he mentions that the geographic location and the ground typology, he mentions explicitly that, they are equally important factors as nutrition is. And so here on the right, you have like the ancient Greek text. I know you cannot read it, but it's there. And this is the part. So he says, uh, apart from all these other things, uh, where one lives, the prevailing conditions and the typology of the soul. So what we call geophysical anomalies in simple terms is uh, a, an area that the there is a big shift in the value of a magnetic field, of a gravity field, or, or, or all these different kinds of, we will see a few different types of phenomena. So the first uh, very important uh, geophysical anomaly is happening when we have this geoelectric phenomena. And that happens when we have induction. And induction, a little bit of electrical engineering that Dan loves, is what happens basically when we change the intensity of a magnetic field, that generates an electrical current in any uh, substance that is conductive. How is that relevant? Because daily we have fluctuations because of the, uh, the the solar cycle and daily we have these fluctuations. So imagine in an area that we have conductive material in the soil, that shift of the magnetic field that is caused by a sunrise or a sunset. And that's why these two were important portals for the ancients to do their rituals and their meditations is because there is a huge shift and that was felt greatly in the ancient temples. And so we have the second, which is called hydrogeophysical phenomena. And this happens when we have something called adsorption. And adsorption happens when electrons are removed from water passing underground through a, a, a rock that has high porosity. This is something like chalk. And this is exactly what happens. Water dissolves in chalk, then the calcium rock is charged negatively uh, by the free electrons and then the water is left positively charged and we all know when we have positive and negative we have electrical current and this caused me uh, to have to move my PhD from the university that I was to another breaking my contracts losing my scholarship and all that why because the department of geophysics where I was the head not the person that I was doing the professor I was doing it with but the director said uh, what you are trying to tell me when I explain all this and I had scientific uh, peer review papers to show him, he said, I have all my library of decades of people before me and always water underground is neutral. So what you're telling me is charlatanism. That's what the guy told me. So that caused me to, you know, have all this whole new journey there. But this is what happens. And this is how uh, uh, Earth currents are uh, created one way. The third phenomena is when we have something called conductivity discontinuity. In a very simple words, we have an area where two types of subsoil meet and we have a fault line. And that is proven to uh, potentiate daily magnetic fluctuations, sometimes over a hundredfold. And here, for example, we see a measurement of electric potential uh, and below we see a cross section in an area that has underground water. And as you can see, uh, the electric potential is far higher in the area above the water. And then uh, I think many of you have heard of what is called orbs. And in uh, my opinion, personally, uh, this can happen. I mean, not all orbs are real in the pictures. Yeah, some of them are just from the picture. The, they are dust sometimes. So the only way to know is again through electrical engineering, because if we measure the ionization in, this, in the air, and we find that to be high, then we have the true orbs, which is, what is it really? It's like a discharge 
of the Earth uh, accumulated um, ions that turns into a plasma sphere. And this has also been replicated in a laboratory. So uh, they have created these plasma spheres in the laboratory uh, in the same way, actually through rock pressure. So through creating rock pressure on quartz, which is piezoelectricity, they can create these luminous spheres. Now, looking at temples and geolocation, this is all the work I was doing in, in my PhD. Uh, this is UK, and we see a radon map, so with blue, and the darkest blue means the highest level of radon. I just plotted out all the megalithic monuments, and guess what? It was a super high correlation in the location of the megalithic yeah, monuments. You, you can see them here in this area. You can see them here in this area. The highest amount of monuments actually is in Cornwall, and it's it's supposed to be also this magical place. I have been there many times. It's literally there's something powerful in all Cornwall, and then they have the highest levels of radon and radioactivity, which is very curious. Here we see the same thing in Portugal. So again, uh, the highest levels are with red, and you see the lowest areas of radon have almost no megalithic monument, which is interesting. And on the right is uh, the correlation with granite. The same is with France. This is uranium. Um, and so we see that many mounds and stone chambers, uh, this is Cahokia in, um, in Illinois in USA, and we see that the biggest uh, mound in the back was placed where the biggest magnetic anomaly was. Um, this is Ken Cliffs outside of New York, and again you see the magnetic lines and where the peak of the magnetic anomaly was is exactly where they placed the stone chamber. And it has yeah. some, some huge slabs inside also that weigh some tons that we don't even know, you know, how they carry them, how they put them there, and how did they know? Again, comes back this question. You know? No, no, like there you can see here. Yeah, map. so here is the stone chamber, yeah, exactly. So this is a geomagnetic field intensity of Stonehenge. Uh, we see like a, a particular gray color, which shows the, the, the value. And then uh, it's a far higher value because we see that uh, white color in Stonehenge. So there is the magnetic anomaly there. Now, looking at ancient Greece, this is a map of Peloponnese. And here we have the temples of Asclepios that were the healing temples. And uh, with um, purple, we have the fault lines. And there's an extremely high correlation between them. And again, the question is, if they knew that the fault line is there, which means a seismic fault, why would they choose to place that there if you know they knew that there could be an earthquake? Yeah, the Asclepia temples are uh, temples that are for healing, uh -huh. it's like exactly. a healing device. But this is like officially, right? In, in the writings, I mean, this is not my own interpretation, but uh, they use them for this reason. And then of course, pyramids have another function because uh, they, it has been measured that they can literally accumulate electric charge at the top. So all the earth's uh, electromagnetic field. Uh, an example is of course, the Giza platform that has a huge aquifer below. And also here we have Chichen Itza that is placed exactly over a cenote, which practically speaking in terms of civil engineering, you will say that this is an unstable place, like you wouldn't want to do that unless there is a particular uh, technology and result. To um, harvest, the, to harvest Exactly. The energy. This is Russia, and this is a correlation of 104 old monasteries, and they are almost all of them placed in uh, over fault lines, which you'll see with gray or areas that have high intensity of seismic uh, activity. So this is, we covered the first part. The first parameter of ancient temples is the location. The second part is the middle, the body of the building itself. And here we have three important things. First, we have geometry of sh or shape. We have the materials and we have the dimension. So geometry, form and shape uh, I'm sure that most people here have heard of cymatics, but what uh, Hans Jenny proved is that there is a direct correlation between frequency and geometry. So different geometry means different frequency. And there are many experiments in the past that have been done, you know, placing, for example, apples below a pyramid. Uh, what sacred geometry does, it literally structures uh, the energy or the ether or whatever you want to call it inside the space. And if you want to imagine it, it would be exactly the same way as water would flow. So uh, this would be like a musical instrument. So the musical instrument has a 
specific geometry, for example, like a flute or an instrument where you blow air, and the way the air moves will create a very different result. So what you want to avoid is these straight lines because that's the way this energy will move. You want to create toroidal spiral waves. Yeah, and also um, the sacred geometry that was incorporated in the design of temples here, we see some ancient Greek temples that are all based on phi ratio, uh, the 1.618 or 0 0.618 uh, or uh, five times a, a specific dimension. And they are creating here resonant cavities, uh, which is, you know, they, they create a structuring of the energy that comes from the earth and they create what we call uh, a, a couple harmonic oscillators. Want to say something? No, 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 exactly that. Yeah, so we have just have to, this is a, a, a few temples that have like the same design as a modern magnetron, which is very interesting. Um, and um, this, this li literally tunes the temple in the technology that is meant to be. The second part, which is materials. What is very curious in is mo most temples around the world, they brought materials like in Stonehenge, 140 miles across um, mountains and valleys, uh, in Cornwall, the altar stone, uh, sorry, in the altar stone was brought from Cornwall, which is 180 miles. The same is with Giza. They brought all the uh, granite from Aswan, which is many hundred miles away. And so, yeah. Yeah, so these materials, for example, they're high content in, in quartz, limestone, granite, high content in magnesium, in clay, iron. It, they're basically paramagnetic stones. And what they wanted to do with that, and the reason that they brought it from so far is that they wanted these particular parameters. They wanted this conductivity because they wanted to first take the charge from the earth, then structure it with sacred geometry and then amplify it and make it even more uh, like a, a more conduct with true conductive materials, make that field even more distributed. So that was the main reason. And then we have something called sacred dimensions. Yeah, which is all the Planck fire, all, all your work, uh, taking from the Planck scale, multiply times phi ratio, and then you have the whole the whole scale. You know, like this. This is from all your work regarding like sacred measurements. So we have the whole tables of how to do it, and exactly when you tune into these frequencies or into these dimensions, you tune into the Planck. Yeah, so what they were using is that, as Dan has showed us very nice, is that uh, cre creating sacred dimensions from the multiplication of Planck and phi ratio in different uh, powers. So what was that doing is literally creating fractality across scales because they were tuning the building from the very, very small, the quantum level to the very, very big in the macrocosm. So in the mesocosm, there was this uh, building that was finely tuned with all these different scales. And then and we just, go to the third just to, part. Just yeah. to say say briefly, that, yeah, and that principle essentially means charge collapse enables centripetal forces. So the, the, the fractality essentially is pointing toward the ability of charge to implode, to get centripetal and negentropic. And just backing up just a little bit, you know, I touched those blue stones at Stonehenge and my hand was tingling. And you realize that, you know, yes, piezoelectric is good and paramagnetic is good. But one of the things is that the, the blue stones and the related the stones that they used to hold ancestors and statues always were super high dielectrics, which means, you know, capacitive efficiency, charge distribution enabled. So it's a super dielectric that really caps off the piezo and the paramagnetic. Yeah, to create this, this energy, this yes. charge. And what we have seen is that from the microcosm to the macrocosm, we in the middle, in the mesocosm, it's like when you have these resonant cavities, literally you can if you're a, a little bit, you know, like, um, sensitive. yeah, sensitive, you can literally feel it. Like it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a spark. Yes, of course. And then we have the third aspect of the temples, again, universal, which is the sky connection. And there are so many um, different researches on what is called archaeoastronomy. So uh, the temples have different astronomical or celestial alignments sometimes with constellations, sometimes with celestial events like equinoxes and solstices, and these are also portals. And this is the portal, it's the same thing as the sunrise and the sunset that I was sharing before. And for example, in the equinoxes, there is something that is called 
a coupling uh, between the magnetic field of the Earth and the uh, magnetic field of the Sun. And there is a huge uh, intensity that happens. And that's why it was an important time. Uh, sometimes monuments were aligned to that or there were specific celebrations or rituals that were, uh, there, that were happening at the time. And also uh, by creating like a blueprint of the sky on the buildings themselves, this created another level of fractality. So a continuation across the scales. Um, so here is an example, of course, this is from Robert Boval, but it's, uh, we can see the Orion alignment in between the Xi'an pyramids in China on the left. Um, then we have the Giza plateau, we have Teotihuacan, and then you see the Orion belt, which is like a, a really incredible thing to think about. This is on another, you know, seminar to do about Atlantis, but uh, how can you have uh, three temple complexes around the world that supposedly have no connection in between them. They have oceans in between them. And for example, the, the main pyramid in Mexico has exactly the same base as Giza and half the height, and both are aligned with uh, Orion. So that's very interesting things uh, to, to talk about. And then um, going into the temple functions, uh, this is things that I have uh, found that I can back up scientifically. And I would say there is at least a few more that I cannot back up, but I think it's true. So first of all, we have altered states of consciousness. Then we have healing technology, seed growth enhancement, and energy generation. And uh, I would add to that uh, stargates. I think the ancient civilizations were able to travel uh, through particular gates in these temples, but this is not something that I have scientific backup. So I leave it to you to, you know, as a food for thought. So other states, uh, what happens is that uh, this has been replicated in the laboratory. Basically, when you have a, a magnetic uh, field fluctuation, that can create uh, tiny micro seizures in the brain. Even a fluctuation around 10 to 40 nanotesla can create that. And the way it's created is in the areas that is called temporal lobes. Here we have something called temples. I find it very interesting that this gets activated in a temple. You know the same word. So um, this has been uh, many times uh, uh, replicated in the laboratory. And uh, what happens is that uh, the ancients will call that a sacred disease. That's how they called epilepsy. But when people were uh, exposed to this kind of fluctuations, even without the rest of the technology of a temple, they experienced visions, they experienced presences and detachment from the body. So they had out of body experiences, literally. And uh, yeah, this was done a lot of work by Michael Persinger in the University of Canada with the God Helmet. Uh, and yeah, I will just go a little bit faster with that because uh, we have a little bit of time left. So this is a, a, a work that was done that we could see how uh, the, the right temporal lobe was uh, activated in a frequency of 110 that was found in many monuments in Europe. Like what happened in this place, uh, Necromantia. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the healing technology is exactly uh, has to do with bioresonance and bioelectromagnetism because as bodies we have a high presence of magnetite and magnetic crystals in the brain and in the area of desmoid, which is in the nose. We have iron in our blood. We have high level of water, uh, and we so as a body we can produce, transmit, and receive electromagnetic fields. We already saw how um, uh, what we call geopathic stress can affect us in many ways. This is an example of cancer incidence rates on fault uh, crossings, and it was 20 times more compared to all around. This is from um, Russia. Yeah, as you can see here, the crossing lines and the red spots. Yeah. Um, and so there is an effect that is really important I wanted to share with you, which is called hormesis. And this basically tells us that there is a specific dose that is an optimum, and when we go to a very high dose, it can be a destructive uh, result. So the same agent, stressful agent in this case, can be like positive or negative for our health. And the same goes for radiation hormesis. So uh, that was done, that was a research done by Lucky and he found out that low doses of ionizing radiation are really necessary for, for our biology. High doses can create problems, but low doses can create stimulation of DNA, detoxify from free radicals, uh, release of growth factors and, and many other things. Yeah, so in this concept of hormesis, that's why you don't stay too long in a very, very powerful place of a temple because it 
it will create the opposite result. Exactly. And, and it's so, actually related to electromagnetics where you have the Paul Brown nuclear battery, a low dose of gamma radiation actually causes a quasi superconductive effect, probably even DNA, very stimulating. But of course the high dose is very fatal. So yes, the trace dose is quasi superconductive. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what happens uh, in ancient temples. They were used for healing because they had this extremely structured implosive Field that they, uh, they they concentrated from the earth and from the sky energy, and so for example, this is the ancient Asclepius in Kos where uh, Hippocrates used to teach. Uh, in the Great Pyramid, we have insulating materials outside, conductive, and then granite in the center. So that created like a super powerful uh, energy generation place that can also, because of all the sacred geometry, it can be used for healing. Um, and um, then we have seed growth enhancement. And what has happened, I mean, uh, Dan and I had talked a lot about it uh, when I was there, but um, what happens is that a lightning can leave back uh, free nitrogen equivalent to one or two years of fertilizer. And that tells that there is some connection between electromagnetism and plant fertility that Dan has explained many times. Um, these are uh, results from uh, measurements that they were done in Latin America. And for example, the seeds that you see uh, in the bottom, they were placed for a, a, a minute, if I remember correctly, on the top of a Mayan pyramid. And the controls were just kept in the hotel. So it has a huge uh, difference. And that's what people can do. And also we've been trying to get uh, this guy in Greece to get a uh, therapy because he wants to activate his seeds even further, even more than the building itself. Here we see Tikal in Guatemala. We were there in um, in the equinox this year. Uh, we had a really very deep experience. And these uh, seedlings were also placed uh, in the top for a minute or two. And the last part is energy generation, which is mostly in the pyramids because they tend to concentrate there. Uh, there was uh, research done by university professors of Russia. And they literally their conclusion, they are mainstream, and they said the Great Pyramid is able to concentrate the electromagnetic um, energy due to its design. So that's for the temples. Remember the three parameters; they are really important. Next time you go to a temple, um, remember they are not just uh, monuments left over there. They were part of the big grid. Uh, we do temple activations, uh, activating twelve. 12 temples every time in the solstices and equinoxes. It's something we do for free. You're very welcome. The next time will be uh, 20th of June. Uh, you can check out our books. Yeah, you can see we have we have written some books. Uh, this one with the with Michael, also of course with Dan. And this one was the first book we wrote, like about psychogeometry and all these studies uh, how sacred geometry can be applied for healing and this one is the the latest one that we we wrote uh, we want also to share with you this is what dan was talking at the beginning <laughs> that we made really yeah. big conference yeah this was maybe this 10 years ago or so this is a very big 2007. conference yeah 2007 the first biological architecture it was uh, in a university in Mexico that's called um, Iberoamericana University. 400 people, right? Yeah, it was <laughs> even the people that were there, like, you know, the, the professors, they were like, no one will come to this type of things. No one likes this type of thing. Uh, everybody was like surprised, like how this thing happened, because actually, I mean, we were, we were working many years before to make this happen, but the the consciousness was already there like now we're so happy to see so many people and so many new yeah. architects and so many you know groups of architects saying okay let's go to the fractal design let's go to you know more natural designs like the the, the whole consciousness is is moving towards there and then there was like a second congress in in uk that was in 2009 and we are organizing the the third one online that of course Dan and Tupan will be participating, which is uh, will be online 12 and 13 of October, which which we will we will gather a lot of people. It will be really amazing, and it will basically be towards very specific technologies for health, like how to relate health to architecture, because we have had that many people that now that there were you know all these crazy things and lockdowns and all these things that they got very yeah like uh, not centered. 
And we have had, you know, many emails and many people asking for that. Like, how can we apply in practical terms? Because sometimes, yes, you have the, the time and the money to invest in doing a new house or a new building or a new hotel. But sometimes, no, sometimes people is like, how can I, what can I do practically in my house to increase the fractality of the space? I'll have better health. Okay. Yeah, and have better health. This is something that, uh, that I, I I love. Like I really like that love is this gravitational force that holds us together, that transforms us, that that actually transcends us. In... And uh, all, on a last note, um, I have a course, the Sacred Science of Ancient Temples, that we will have uh, available in a in a bid in Geophilia, and also Arturo will have his own course. Uh, which is going to be uh, cosmic design, linking the micro, macro, and macrocosm. Um, and I just want to leave you with something that I have uh, very dear to my heart, which is a, a temple research uh, protocol that I have created, which includes a lot of scientists, professors, engineers. And we have a permit to uh, do this research in uh, 50 ancient Greek temples. It took us years to take the permits. We want to expand that. Uh, in uh, Europe with stone circles and Mexican pyramids, but we are looking for funding. So these are the 50 temples we have. It includes ancient oracle spaces, temples of Asclepios and uh, other kinds of um, other kinds of places. So this includes uh, measurements uh, on the earth and includes measurements of people. So there are two uh, protocols that I put together many years of research. And we want to draw more conclusions. We want to publish scientific papers and results. And also I have this vision of creating a documentary so it can be explained to people that are not into deep science and understand really how this technology works. And so uh, this is something that I like to say and I like to share. Ancient temples are a lost technology. They were constructed amongst other reasons as an investment for people's well-being. Um, and the, all these things we are applying through the science of space harmonics at Geophilia to create spaces that support our health, our well-being, for transformation, uh, for spiritual evolution. This is our website. Uh, feel free to contact us, send us an email with questions if you have, and uh, Telegram or WhatsApp. This is our number. So. Well, thank you. Well, congratulations. That was fabulous. Very intense, very intense and powerful. <laughs> and so we're going to go to questions here very shortly. I just wanted to say, I know one of the primary questions there was also, you know, how do we measure the sacred space, et cetera? And one of the main technologies we're using, which also our other partner, Juan Schlosser, demonstrated at length in Bali and his lectures upcoming on these subjects, which is flameinmind.com. It's a, you take the brainwave device and you're measuring a microvolt and then spectrum analyzing, which is the weak capacitance of the room. And if you see the Schumann harmonics in the room, basically it's imploding. So a lot of these technologies, the sacred buildings, is basically simply a way to amplify the Schumann harmonic cascade, which is a phase conjugate pump wave, which creates life force and implosion. So the earth's heartbeat as it were, which is why the pyramid was called the Hummer. So the answer to the question of how we've measured some of these things among many tools that Lydia has researched is not is actually yeah. flame in mind. Yeah, we have, we have also been using the Korokov machine. Oh yes. Uh, the GDB. GDB. It mm -hmm. has another add-on that is called Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And actually we go to places, we have the measurements, and you, you, you measure what's the um, conductivity, you know, like what's the capacitance, yeah, the capacitance of, of the space. Uh, for closed spaces, works like amazingly. Like it really works very good. Yes. And <laughs> Krotkoff and I had that conversation. The Sput Sputnik is measure basically measuring the charge distribution efficiency of the air and the harmonic inclusiveness. So that is very parallel to harmonic inclusiveness, which we measure with flame in mind, which is also measuring the capacitance, but in this case by by power spectra for harmonic inclusiveness, parallel to the way Karakov is essentially measuring charge radiance efficiency and measuring the fractality of the shadow of the capacitor. <laughs> but yeah, and, and sometimes many years ago we were uh, with engineers, we were measuring the um, the not the dynamic but the static electric field, and many years ago, but it was at some point it was really expensive, and they take like a lot of days to go in every single point and measure what's the difference of you know like in, in every spot so we have to come with you know faster solutions but yeah there is so much to do there but the the, the basic philosophy was from bioarchitects.net and also with the health of juan schlosser coming up was that 
after he measured for the harmonics included with flame in mind in a bamboo building and then did the same in, in you know, concrete made with metal rebar, prove that not only could you measure, but you could prove which building will kill a seed and which building is going to germinate a seed and therefore determine which architect gets a paycheck. And that's the basic idea of bioarchitects.net. So we correlated the measurement to the life force. So that's wonderful. And this was so exciting. So we should probably move toward questions here too. Fun. Have you assembled? Are you ready to do with some questions? Yes, sure. Uh, but first of all, I would like to encourage um, everyone who are interested in sacred geometry and architectural design to take online courses from uh, from Lydia and Arturo. Uh, we made a, a workshop in Bodrum five years ago with Lydia and Arturo, and it was a great success. Everybody loved it. We That's had Turkey. Uh, Turkey. feedback <laughs> in Turkey. Yeah, so I really well, encourage you. everyone to uh, look into Geophilia and uh, Arturo and Lydia's um, uh, uh, science and I workshop. Yeah, they had we, fun. We made a, 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 a physical workshop, like not online, like a real one. Yeah, it was last... temple right. sacred geometry. We drew and we also went to temples after and we were linking what we had learned to, you know, uh, visiting temples that were exactly over a fold line and doing meditation. Right. There. It was wonderful. And yeah, yeah, we had was, great fun. Yeah, we, we should repeat that soon. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember we went to this, uh, it was thing. the Vivi Mother, you uh, love uh, it. Uh, yeah. He loves this temple. <laughs> the temple that we went, I think, was Apollo, no? It was Didima. Didima, yes. Didima. exactly. Right, right. Didima. That was huge. <laughs> I think it's my best. I, I asked Arturo, what is your favorite ancient Greek temple? And he tells me this one. <laughs> It was my favorite. It has been my favorite until now. Architecturally, it is extremely uh, similar to uh, Parthenon, actually, and the design of it. It's massive. It's huge. Like, I remember the columns and everything is just so megalithic. Like, I, I don't think in mainland Greece, I mean, that part was Greece in the past, but in mainland Greece, we don't have that huge, um, like, uh, dimension. It's, it's really massive, this place. <laughs> We should do questions because we're running out of time here. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Sure. All right. Um, so um, how can one register to the October online conference? We will release uh, very, very soon uh, all the instructions. Just to make sure you uh, register for our newsletter because that's where we will release it first. And then it will also be in the website. So if you follow us through our newsletter, you will have all the details, the first people that can register. Yeah, just go geophilia.org and subscribe to the newsletter. Every week we send news. Yeah. Okay. And regarding the first um, architectural design that you guys showed, um, Air Crete Harry asks, how about using basalt rebar and mesh? Yeah, like would, would basalt rebar or, or bamboo rebar or carbon fiber rebar, all of which keep the charge into the concrete, would any of them be legal there? Yes, it, it's amazing to do it. It's just that sometimes what we have had, depending on the country, they will allow yeah. it or not. Yeah. Because sometimes regulations, I mean, it's politics. Because yeah. actually they work, they work perfectly good. But fiberglass yeah, also. Fiberglass. And I do want to tell a short story in Torino there, you know, with Claudia and Hudai. So the authorities in Italy required they put steel rebar in the basement concrete, but for the rest of the building, they allowed them to use the hemp and carbon fiber rebar. And it's amazing in that building, in the upper stories, your aura breathes, but you go in the damn basement and your aura doesn't, doesn't breathe. You can feel it. Yeah, what, what we have done to counterbalance that when we are forced to use uh, steel is that we ground it. Like literally we yeah. have a ground pole. Could help. Could help. And also the, the, this powder that we use in all the concrete that really counterbalances all the negative effects because it creates higher levels of implosion. And, and the power powder would be piezo and paramagnetic. Yes. 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 Exactly. Go ahead, Tufan. All right. So uh, a question regarding radon radon at the temple sites, Amer yes. asks, I believe radon is a cancer causing agent. Is that correct? Wonder how that is used to create a sacred site. Any comments would be great. Thank you. Outstanding presentation. I mean, I know I have to go very fast through the Teplum technology. So if you get the book or if you want to get into the course in the future, you will understand more. But what I was trying to share is that all these agents, anything in our lives, basically, uh, being it physical or emotional or anything else that is a stress agent, 
and radon is one of them, they all go under the process of hormesis. So a very small dose and a short exposure can actually create healing. And I will give you an example, other example. So over long term, yes, they create cancer. Actually, all geophysical anomalies that I showed, including magnetic anomalies, radioactivity, um, all kinds of anomalies, they can create cancer over the long term, but over the short term, uh, they create actually healing. And the reason is hormesis. Uh, I will give an example that is quite shocking that I, I have been collaborating with a medical doctor when I was doing my PhD, a uh, really special uh, guy that actually he created a device that is a patent. And for that, he was put seven years on trial uh, in the court uh, for the highest level uh, in, in terms of uh, the jury. I don't know how it's called. Like if you have killed a person, basically. Uh, and what he did is that he he was able through uh, creating a spectrum analysis of a substance and re-emitting that on people, he was created healing uh, in terms of, okay, chemotherapy just on a spectrum and then re-emitted was just creating positive effects. So the same um, medical doctor, he told me that there are uh, two different experiments and these are peer reviewed published experiments. One is that they placed rats uh, around a mobile phone that is uh, this kind of microwave, sorry, microwave radiation. And after some time that it was uh, turned on all the time with a phone call and, you know, they were activating it all the time, uh, most of the rats developed cancer. But there is another group that they're not related on the other side. And what they did is they had rats with cancer that already have cancer for whatever reason. And they placed the same mobile phone, similar, meaning the same microwave radiation, and they gave them a very small dosage of that, a very short exposure in terms of time, and that actually healed their cancer. And that's a shocking discovery because it's the same agent. It's, so radioactivity it's... as a short dose can actually create massive healing, whereas if it's a daily accumulative, uh, like a big exposure in terms of time and dose, yes, radon will create uh, many problems. It, it also sounds a bit like homeopathy, you know, a little bit of the poison type of yes. thing. <laughs> but it's another way, another way to think about also is that, um, you know, putting a, a pyramid or a sacred site over a fault over, over water, which you would not want to sleep there, but it does create compression. And when you create compression, you create something that your aura can benefit and ride like a, a wave. But the other thing too is, you know, the reason there's mercury in the pyramid is similar to why there's water under the pyramid. It will add to the inertia of the piezoelectric force of the Hummer, uh, amplifying yes. the phase conjugate Schumann cascade. So it's very interesting yes. physics. Exactly that, exactly that. Uh, go, go ahead, Tufan. Uh, yeah, Kat also says that there are mines in Montana that people use for healing from exposure to radon. Yeah, mines in Montana, so they use it for healing. Good, good point. Oh, yes. Wow. So another Great. question is, we, I mean, if you think about it, everything right. that we call thermal springs or thermal waters, usually they're radioactive. And why do people go there for healing? Yeah, exactly funny. that. Go ahead, Tuban. Thank you. Okay, Sabina asks, which sacred geometry shapes and forms do you use to engrave into floors and buildings? Yeah, what floors of buildings? Uh, Every person or every project, ha we design a specific geometry. So it's not like one geometry, we weave it always. And that has to do with the specific project, with the person. And we have seen that through the time, like you can actually measure that. You can measure what's your the best geometry you can use. With the, Dan, he has many tools regarding the heart coherence and the brain coherence. So you literally approach any geometry, you get it closer to your body and you will see what geometry you react better and, and which one not. But basically to your question, it's, it depends on their elements. So we do the five element chart and we do the voice harmonic analysis. And from all these analysis, we custom design the power symbol and that part of that can be applied to the custom grid that we create for that particular project. So it's a very custom um, design yeah. for every project. So it's tailored based on the needs of the project. Right. Um, all right, these are all the questions that I have.
Well, um, I think we should um, also mention some of the generalized principles here, just to say that whenever we find compression in charge fields, where there's implosion in the charge field, there's a communion of information, which is rather like the essence of mind and consciousness itself. So where the environment serves to allow the charge to implode, you get that tornado effect where consciousness can be served because the environment itself serves centripetal force. That's the general principle here. You know, it's it's not that the concrete itself was evil. The concrete is actually relatively paramagnetic with the limestone. It's, it's the rebar that was the problem. But, you know, as Steiner went from a wooden Gertianum after the fire to the, to the concrete Gertianum, but he did not use steel because he knew that essentially that living buildings are an implosive capacitor by definition. But, but what I think is particularly wonderful here is that Arturo and Nina of the teams of biologic architects working around the world, many of which we have at bioarchitects.net, Arturo and Nina are really an example of outstanding commercial high-level success in major demonstration projects uh, that just show how professional and advanced and gorgeous, like, like a Hilton hotel, but conscious. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, you're going to see uh, another flavor of this when we get to Juan Schlosser, who really, you know, multi-million dollar temple contracts in India now, where, you know, the ancient cultures like in India are beginning to recognize that the ancient traditions of Feng Shui and Vastu actually, once you begin to think about the electrical engineering, it brings to a climax so many traditions into a pure principle, which is teachable and self-empowering. The myth was gorgeous, but the pure principle in physics is even more shareable. <laughs> yeah, something uh, of what you say, like how to avoid these steel rebars and yes when you cannot we just ground it and we have actually measured I mean, of course electromagnetically speaking and also energetically speaking it's not the same but at least electrically it helps because everything is grounded so you don't have like this faraday cage effect yes and it's, it's, it's a also simple solution it's beautiful. It's also, uh, we want to say how wonderful that Lydia, having joined Arturo with her background in, you know, the very technical electrical studies on this, forms such a beautiful complement to the team that has now gone global. It's really cool. <laughs> so and, anyway, the the compliments here are great. Uh, Morris says, uh, uh, no, Brittany says, wonderful research and work. Thank you for presenting. Well done. I spent a few hours researching re reviewed the designs on your website. Just amazing. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. Brittany. Anything else, Tufan? Are we good? Yeah, the, uh, did we cover the question how we can measure the frequency emitted in these grid formations that you create in the foundation of yeah, buildings? Ma yeah, Maura's last question there was we how to measure. So we did talk yeah. about um, the flame in mind .com using the Muse EEG tr um, transducer, which measures the microvolts to measure life force. So that is life force measure at flameinmind.com, which is a great tool, but there are others and it's parallel to, as Arturo mentioned, the the, the Sputnik from GD, GDV Karatkov. And these things fit together. So essentially measuring whether it's charge distribution efficiency, fractality in air or harmonic inclusiveness in the capacitor, these terms essentially mean the same thing. <laughs> they mean, can the charge be distributed? Hey, Ave, heaven, you know, <laughs> where charge takes flight. <laughs> so yes, um, we had fun. Go ahead. Did you want to no, say something? Um, there you... is a AMR, I don't know the name, but it says like, I'm a licensed builder in California. So wouldn't you want to build temple homes, but rather the retreat area? So yeah, just on a quick one is exactly what I said. So the the areas where people live or stay in a retreat center you wouldn't want them to be like a temple because that will create problems but where the healing happens or the meditation happens that needs to be like a temple and that needs to have all the uh, implosive uh, charge distribution all the things that dan explained and all the uh, complex design and the temple parameters that i mentioned yeah so imagine, imagine is like you're going to plug into a very high level voltage super fractal energy generator place so you don't want that 24 7. Exactly. you want to sleep and to rest and you want to put your house your you home. want that hormetic effect uh -huh. the short term get in get out get the best effect and then get maybe next day but short term 
Yeah, After indigenous peoples. It's in a more mild place. Yeah, indigenous peoples never lived in their sacred space. Uh, and that and then Maura's last question, do you believe that these buildings are quantum communication devices, which Lydia just spoke to? But just to say, then that language, which describes the convergence place of charge compression as what is effectively a longitudinal interferometry coherence node, where we have all this language now that we see that the longitudinal propagation is the physics of the collective unconscious and the physics of gravity waves and the physics of all action at a distance. So the longitudinal node, interestingly, now we're just doing new work with um, Tony Rodriguez, who's he's teaching uh, remote viewing, you know, internationally. And he noticed that at the obelisks, the remote viewing is better, which is the nodes of the longitudinal array. Very similar to the way Karatkov proved that inner, you know, military quality telepathy was also at the same grid nodes of what he called the sacred grid, what we call the nodes of the longitudinal array. So the longitudinal EMF coherence nodes, which bounce in the dodeca ecosa star mother kit fractal, uh, is another way, precise language to talk about the fact that this is DNA radio and telepathy at work. Anyway. Okay, Mara, Mara's question, I just want to add one last thing. I did mention that the stargates or uh, the travel uh, through the ancient temples, but the second one is exactly what she's saying, what you explained, which is um, communication devices. And there is a work from Constantine Mail that has a huge book on scala waves. And he literally developed his theory around that. And he explains what I was saying today about uh, the tuned cavities, and he says the most efficient way to transmit is not through an antenna design, is through a tuned cavity, and he proves all that, and he, his own perspective is that ancient temples were used for, like a radio, so they were transmitting messages to one another, and yes. now I cannot prove that exactly today, that's why I don't mention it, but great question, Mara, thank you so much, and I do believe that it was part of the function of the ancient temples. Yes, and, and just to say that the, the scalar wave is another language for longitudinal interferometry, really. And interestingly, you know, when Grebennikov discovered that he was floating when he used the right insect skeletons, physicists who discovered the, the capacitance of why insect skeletons made gravity used the word tuned cavity effect, actually. <laughs> Literally implosion in a capacitor. For Maura, it's Constantine Mayo with a K. M-E-Y-L, M-E-Y-L, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, who studied launch? Wrote the book. Yeah, yeah, beautiful work on that. So, guys, we had such fun tonight. We can't thank you guys enough, uh, Lydia and Arturo and geophilia.org. This has been fabulous. You guys are so advanced on this. I'm sure you've inspired lots of people. This is a shareable wave. Remember that Lydia and Arturo are reachable at geophilia.org. Their major conference is coming up in October online, and they will be with us at our conference in late September in South France, fractalfield.com slash 2024. So stay tuned. More, more fun is to come. Thank you, Arturo and Lydia. Thank you, Tufan. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, for everyone. Hope you had fun tonight. Thanks, Dan. Thank, Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you, you all. Much love, blessings. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You guys are like family. Thank you, guys. Let's let's be a family. What else is fun? <laughs> what else more? Absolutely, Dan. Thank love you. you, everybody. See you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Toodles. Bye. <laughs>